see this energy balance equation here. It's think about a skit, you know, kind of two scales um, with a pivot point in the center. You got energy intake, which is food in, and then caloric expenditure or storage, which is kind of calories out. So calories in, calories out. Um, when it comes to calories in, we're really talking about food. And so we always encourage people to follow the dietary guidelines um, to kind of go with that. Talk with registered dietitians um, if you have troubles. But when we look at that, um, that's one part of it. And then the other part is caloric expenditure or storage. And so you have to take into account things like exercise, um, your your basal metabolic rate, which is the fact that your body burns calories just sitting here being alive. It takes energy. Um, realize other things that affect caloric expenditure um, that we don't think about as much. So uh, our behaviors, so you know, kind of our job, maybe our careers, occupation, environmental factors, whether it's whether we can go outside and be active or it has to be inside, cultural factors and social factors, so the people we hang out with and the foods that um, come into that, um, and then our emotions play a role. And so all of these things come into looking at this energy balance. And so it's not a one-size-fits-all. Um, it's a very complex thing, but we do know that exercise can help this equation and can be beneficial in this energy balance to help someone um, to kind of fall in that normal weight range. And the reason that we talk about that is to just make sure that they uh, don't have adverse health effects from their weight is the truth um, concept and the, the thought be behind this. It's not just to make everyone the same. It's really trying to look at their health. Um, and so what table 6.2 does is it kind of starts to put into perspective um, activity and how uh, calories are associated with that, like how many calories you're burning with activity um, and uh, what that looks like on this scale. So remember that there are 3,500 calories in a pound, basically, of body weight. And so if you're sedentary or sitting for two and a half hours a week, you're going to burn about 190 calories. If you walk at about four miles an hour for two and a half hours throughout the week, so again, just totaling up, you're going to burn about 940 calories. So what you can see is there's a, you're burning an additional throughout the week, you're burning an additional um, around 700 to 750 calories from this, um, which is a big difference because you're talking about in a matter of a few weeks, if your uh, caloric intake stays the same and you go from sitting to walking, um, you can lose a pound. You can lose a few pounds after the course of a few months. If you start jogging or running at seven miles an hour, you bump that caloric expenditure up to 20, um, 2,100 calories or so. And so you can see within about a week of running versus sitting, someone could burn that, you know, close to that half a pound marker or so. And if you increase that to five hours or 300 minutes per week, you can see those numbers really double and can make tremendous moves. Um, and so you can also see how much work it takes to burn 3,500 calories. Um, it does take a lot of physical activity to do that and to get those weight changes that people always seek with physical activity, um, but it's much harder than people actually realize, and this helps kind of give you a visual of that. Um, so part of the reason we talk about obesity and overweight is the prevalence of it. Um, in the United States, almost three-quarters of the population are considered to be overweight or obese. Um, the world, it's estimated that around 1.9 billion in 2016 adults, so uh, that would be, uh, we have about 7 billion, 7.5 billion people in the world right now, so you can see that's somewhere around a third, not quite a third. Definitely 25% of adults would be considered overweight and obese. Um, and so we, we tend to see those continue just to increase, especially among adolescents and children. Uh, and you can see this through obesity trends maps. Maybe you've seen these before with adults. This is just the U.S. This is just obesity, so it's not counting overweight. Um, but you can see the trend uh, from 1994 to 2000 to 2015. Um, you can see that chart changed a lot. Um, and so you can see we went from an average of maybe around 14%, 15%, you know, somewhere around in there of people being considered obese to 2015, which is quite a few years ago at this point. Uh, the entire nation was over 26, uh, probably closing, uh, approaching close to that 30% mark, honestly, with the 2015 numbers. Uh, so you can see those. Um, you can also see some obesity trends among children and adolescents tracked 
Um, these are uh, some different studies that, that have got, or different age groups. Looking at those, uh, it's started in kids as young as two and five and then just continues on up. Um, and you can just see that they've continued to climb all the way through. There's a little, some points of um, kind of it going down, but we can see that there's been a tremendous growth even in our children. Uh, the economics cost of this, which is always a factor at looking at this, it's not just about health, but uh, the cost of people on treating these, uh, obesity and you know excessive weight and being inactive, there's a cost to that. And so you can save people money, and this can save you money and save other people's monies and actually take the burden off of things like health insurance if everyone starts to um, kind of be a little bit healthier. And so you can see what the cost was um, with physical activity, with uh, excess weight, and then when you combine those, what that uh, kind of cost was, that total cost. And you can see it's again, has slowly and continually gone up over a number of years. Um, so from that, the, again, we've talked a lot about the health, and sometimes we forget about the health concerns, and we think that weight is the problem itself. And it does, it has its own issues that come along with it, but it's, it's a lot of the health consequences from obesity and being overweight. Things like uh, coronary heart disease that we talked about last time, type 2 diabetes, uh, some cancers are more prevalent in those people that are obese. We have hypertension and dyslipidemia, which we've talked a lot about these, um, but there are other things as well, increasing uh, liver and gallbladder diseases, the risk of stroke. Uh, some people have trouble sleep sleeping and have respiratory problems because of it. Osteoarthritis um, and uh, even gynecological problems. So an, ab an abnormal menstrual cycle, infertility, that type of thing. And so that's going to increase to mental health. If you really want a child and you can't because of your weight, that can put big issues uh, for someone's health, mental health and physical health. Um, and so when we look at obesity and overweight, there are risk factors that come into play with those, just like with any kind of um, health condition or any kind of thing we're talking about with people. Um, and so we have modifiable risk factors. Um, so these would be things like physical inactivity. We can help someone to be less physically inactive. It's a slow process sometimes, and you have to work them up, but that is a factor. Um, if someone eats a lot of excess calories, so maybe they don't eat a lot, but what they do eat has a lot of calories in it, or maybe they just eat a lot, that would play a role into this and something that can be modified. Um, and then we know that people of low socioeconomic status tend to be uh, more likely to be obese. Um, and so when you think about this, if someone... Um, when we say low socioeconomic status, uh, we're usually talking about those that make less money in a given year and live uh, all over, that it's not confined to one space, but don't make enough to really support, um, you know, what's going on. They, they struggle to provide for themselves. So think food, uh, clothing, housing, that type of thing, your essentials. Well, if you're worried about those particular things, um, you're not worried about what you're eating. You're just worried about the fact that you have food. Um, you're not worried about um, exercising. You're just happy to be able to uh, get to a job and have power and have food. And usually those people are working very hard to get there and don't have time to focus on their exercise for health um, because they're worried about just providing and making sure that they can live. But with overweight and obesity risk, we also have non-modifiable risk factors. Um, these are things like age. We know as you get older, you you, your risk for being overweight and obese tend to go up. Um, we know that um, your genetics play a role. They can play um, a pretty significant role. I mean, it's not the whole thing. They can, uh, research is looked at and said anywhere between 10 and, you know, 30 to 40 percent of, of overweight and obesity can be explained through genetics. If both of your biological parents are obese, uh, you're more likely to be obese by five or ten times more likely than someone who has neither parent as obese. Um, and this isn't just about lifestyle. It, it's truly genetics, but uh, your culture plays a role in this. Your race, race and ethnicity also play a role. Think about culture. Maybe you're part of a religion, and certain religions um, you know, practice certain customs of how they eat, or your culture may eat a certain food a lot. Um, you know, Asian... 
uh, culture tends to consume a lot of fish. It's it's part of their culture. Um, where in the South, they tend to eat a lot of fried foods, and you can see how culture can play a role. And then your metabolism and all of our metabolisms, how much energy it's taking to keep us alive minute by minute, that is um, that is something we don't fully have control over. We're all a little bit different in that. Some people it's a little higher. Some people it's a little bit lower. There are some clinical conditions for this that can be treated with medications, but it's not a, a pill that automatically fixes this metabolism. Um, it's something that is is there your entire life. Uh, and so um, when we think about overweight and obesity, um, we know that um, there are challenges that come with it. So a lot of people say, well, why can't they just exercise or why can't they do this, that, and the other, and it's because once you get to a point of being obese or overweight, it's not as easy to overcome some things as it was maybe when you weren't. And so this would be weight loss becomes a lot harder. Um, typically to get to that point, you've had a caloric intake that is higher than your caloric expenditure for a while, and so you have to learn to change habits, whether that's eating habits or exercising habits or maybe both. Um, and then with those, once you once maybe you've worked towards losing weight, uh, maybe you have a hard time actually maintaining your weight um, for various reasons because you um, because of the lifestyle you're in, the culture you're in, those types of things, and so that tends to lead to weight gain, regain. So you lose weight and then you regain that weight back over a short period of time. Um, your body weight status is always being used um, and can be something that holds you back because of how people may perceive that. Um, and it tends to be as people get larger, they can have more excessive weight gain uh, because they get into these kind of positive feedback loops. Um, and so what you can see here is weight loss um, related to interventions. Um, basically, it's showing you what happens uh, for someone over a course of time, their change in their body weight. And you can see with exercise, exercise they did lose weight, but it was a very slow and very low uh, decrease in weight. So you're looking at, this says, this is measured in kilos. Um, so it's about, let's say, two kilos over the course of six months. That's about five pounds, uh, four and a half, five pounds over the course of six months. And someone's just exercised, they haven't changed their diet. That can be discouraging and it needs to be something that is discussed. Um, we can see diet had a bigger response, a much greater response. They lost Oh, around 9 or 10 kilos, which is around, you know, 18 to 20 pounds or so. And then diet and exercise, when we combine diet and exercise for weight loss, we see the greatest effect and we can see people continuing with it because those work well together. And actually, we see probably better health outcomes doing both of those as well. Um, you can see that uh, those that tend to be uh, more active tend to have lower BMIs. So kind of looking at those scales of what kind of defines overweight and obesity. Um, if you really look at this scale, there's it's really not a huge difference. It's about one on kilo, uh, on it's one on the BMI scale, which isn't huge, but it, it's a big deal at the same time because um, we can see that there is a difference between those that are active and those that are less active, and it definitely still helps. Um, so when it comes to it, there's lots of different ways that we can assess for um obesity and being overweight and a lot of times that's going to come down to um, the simplest measurement is going to be weight so looking at your ideal body weight looking at your BMI but that doesn't paint the whole picture and we would like to look at your body composition and what are you made up of and how does that fit in um, and so we look at how much of you is fat like how much fat you have and this is correlated with body weight this is correlated uh, with health outcomes almost as much if not more than your your weight itself um, and it paints a better picture because just because maybe you weigh a lot uh, you may not have a lot of fat um, and so think again about professional athletes this can be a big thing where someone may think they're unhealthy but if we look at their fat percentage they're actually in a healthy range even though their weight indicates they're not and vice versa older adults you can see older adults that have a normal weight but if you looked at their um, how much fat they have, they have a lot of fat compared to um, their body weight. And so this would indicate that maybe they have health outcomes that aren't as obvious as, um, as we would think because their weight is normal. And so when we look at this fat, 
Um, there are different types of fat. There are essential fats. So there's a certain amount of fat we all need in order to be able to live and function properly. And so that essential fat um, means that we can't just be zero fat. That's impractical and no one should be striving for that. And along with that, we have ideal body fat. So there's a range of what, what should our fat be uh, for people you know, when we look at that, just like we have ideal body weight, and then using all of these together, we can start to get a sense of where someone truly stands and especially how it's affecting their health. Um, so there's a lot of ways uh, that you can actually kind of measure these things, uh, measure body composition um, There's uh, and body weight. So there's the visual inspection. So just kind of looking at someone, um, we know that fat is less dense than muscle, so fat doesn't weigh more than muscle, or muscle doesn't weigh more than fat. Fat is less dense than muscle. So someone who may have excess body fat is, is tending to gonna take up a little bit more room than someone who has a normal amount of body fat. Um, and also, muscles can be used. They can um, be rigid and show structure where fat tends to be um, not as structured. And so you can see, based on a visual inspection, BMI doesn't matter. <clears throat> doesn't measure body composition. Um, this simply measures how how much weight you have compared to your height. Um, visual inspection and BMI are very easy to do. They're very cheap, but they can be the most inaccurate because we're looking for certain things that don't indicate how much fat is there. It's a guide, but they can be thrown off by uh, various things. The best way to uh, measure body composition and see how much fat someone has is through an MRI. Um, or CT scan, or what's called a DEXA scan. These use different things. So um, MRIs use magnetic imaging. So think of a giant magnet, kind of takes a picture of the body. Um, CT uses um, a type of radiation, and DEXA uses a low amount of X-ray radiation um, to look inside the body and measure how much muscle you have and bone you have and how much fat you have, and it's very accurate. Um, they can be expensive, and not everyone needs these necessarily, but these give us the best picture of where someone stands. Um, we also have things like underwater weighing, so hydrostatic weighing. Um, you being weighed underwater can let us know how much fat you have in your body because fat tends to float in water and muscle and bone tends to sink in water. And so the more someone weighs underwater, so literally we put you underwater and, and weigh you, um, we can start to get a picture of how much uh, body composite or how much fat you have what your body composition is because someone who weighs more underwater tends to have less fat and more muscle. Other ways would be something like air ples plasmography. Uh, this is where we literally see how much room you take up. Um, the more room you take up at a certain weight and height, the more fat we know you have, and the less room you take up, the more muscle you would have. Um, skin fold measurements is where we measure how much uh, skin, or how much fat is right underneath the skin in several locations on the body. And then there's equation to done that can be done to give you um, your body composition or your percent body fat. Um, we have biological impedance analysis, BIA. This is where we take an electrical signal and send it through the body and time that. And based on how long it takes, we can estimate your body fat percentage because electricity travels very well through muscle that is mostly water. It does not travel very well in fat. Uh, it tends to slow down in fat because it doesn't contain a lot of water. And then we also have simpler measurements that aren't as expensive um, that you can do. So circumferences, so uh, taking into account your height, your weight, your BMI, maybe how you look, but then uh, taking a waist circumference and how uh, big around your hips are and, and legs and things like that starts to give us more information than just your weight alone or just your BMI and starts to show us the picture of where your health may be be affected, if at all, by your body composition or by your um, weight or being ob obese or overweight or underweight. Um, and so the scientific evidence shows a lot. Um, we've talked about the physical activity guidelines several times in here. They were chosen for a reason. Um, and the reason that it was kind of looked at is it was that calories in versus calories out. And we know that at least 150 minutes of activity per week at the moderate level is needed to help just prevent weight gain um, and just trying to maintain someone's uh, physical activity uh, or trying to maintain where they're at. Um, and this is the same with the, the updated guidelines looking at it through kind of a, a BMI. Um, 
they're focusing on weight maintenance, just trying to keep people from gaining weight because on average, an adult gains about one to two pounds per year. Um, and so they're at least trying to get you that 150 minutes of activity to stop that from happening and then maybe slowly get you up to a point to have more activity that can help um, lose weight. Um, and there's really strong evidence that says if you get over 300 minutes of activity, so if you get over about an hour of activity every single day, um, you will start to um, start to lose weight. You'll, you'll attenuate that weight gain. You'll stop that weight gain and, and possibly start to lose weight. Um, we, we don't think that this matters regardless of male, female. We're, we're pretty sure that happens. We're not 100% sure. Um, there's also limited evidence um, that uh, there's limited evidence in a dose response relationship with physical activity and risk of weight gain. So greater amount of physical activity associated with a lower risk of weight gain. That tends to be true. Again, there's not a ton of evidence on that. Um, we also, um, we also see that older adults, um, sorry, what we're saying here in the next one is um, that the greater amounts of physical activity tend to have greater effects on decreasing weight gain. Um, again, not so sure about older adults. As you get older, it tends to, to diminish some, but we do know that that tends to be true so far in what we've seen. Um, we don't really know if um, this is the same in every race and every socioeconomic status or every initial weight status. We're not haven't looked at that we would think that it probably is but we just don't know it hasn't been looked at when it comes to the research um, and we also don't know about really light intensity activity so think about just a slow walk like walking um, you know through a grocery store how much how much does that have an effect on weight gain and there's really just not anything to indicate either way whether it's bad good or maybe doesn't help at all um, so Again, all this is for adults so far, and so we're going to continue to kind of look at what that says. Um, we do know that the more time you spend being sedentary, the higher risk of weight gain is. Um, we also know that um, there's kind of a dose response relationship with that. Basically, the more activity or the more sedentary behavior, usually the higher the weight would go. Again, some evidence on those. Um, and then we, we aren't 100% sure if that is related to any kind of sex, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, or anything like that, but we tend to see just across the board uh, that is what is being indicated. Um, and so we continue on with that, and eventually we, we want to talk about children, children and adolescents as well. Um, we, we know that, again, based on those physical activity recommendations, higher levels of physical activity um, have multiple benefits for kids, in all kinds of ways, and so we encourage that. Um, and so we're starting to narrow down to different categories by different ages on when should these things go um, and kind of looking at how young should we start and how how young should this be kind of implemented to make sure we're giving our kids the best uh, shot at, at being physically active, not having to worry about this their entire life. Um, and so... We don't 100% know if being 100% sedentary is going to lead to weight gain, um, but we're pretty strong. There's a lot of strong evidence that um, television viewing or screen time um, than just sedentary behavior, because think sedentary is even sitting at your desk in school writing something. But we do know television screen time, that tends to show an increase in weight gain the more of that a child has. Um so again, it continues to go on and does a lot of the things of, of showing that we should be um, exercising and that's going to help with weight gain uh, and help with all those adverse uh, effects from it. And so that kind of wraps up this chapter. Uh, kind of go over the chapter. Let me know if you have questions. Look at the review stuff and the, the um, study questions and key terms. And uh, you guys have a wonderful day.